Good morning. Everybody stand up. <laughs> Jumping jacks? Yeah, be good. <laughs> Having fanny fatigue. <laughs> Big stretch. Lovely. Sit. <laughs> um, the topic uh, for today is uh, a case that has come down from the Supreme Court, and it's a biotech case. Oh my God, it's about <laughs> DNA, and um, that's 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 going to be a problem. Um, here's what the invention was: the inventors discovered, isolated, and characterized two human genes. They're called BRCA1 and BRCA2, and there were mutations in those genes that were associated with breast cancer. Uh, and they developed diagnostic tests, and they developed drug screening tests from the isolated genes. So it was, um, turned out, um, a very, very important invention. Lots of lives were saved based, based on this invention. Uh, turns out that the patentees turned out to be the bad guys in this situation. Um, maybe, maybe not painted in the nicest light they could have been, but we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, what are we talking about? What's part of the statute, patent statute, was an issue? And what uh, it's section, it's uh, our section 101. So we've heard about 103, we're going to go back two spaces, and we're going to talk about section 101. And what section 101 says is whoever invents or discovers any new and useful process, machine, manufacture, or composition of matter, uh, or any new and useful improvement thereof may obtain a patent subject to the conditions and the requirements of, uh, of this title. And one of those extra requirements is the one we just heard about uh, for the last hour, was is non-obviousness. So when we talk about, we call these the statutory classes of invention, that is machines and manufacturers and compositions of matter. When we talk about those things, we talk about it in terms of being eligible subject matter. You need to keep, you need to keep, that, in, keep that in mind. Um, once the invention uh, qualifies for patent protection, that is, it's eligible, uh, then the PTO examines the application with regard to the other requirements of patentability. Uh, and those are things like utility, novelty, <laughs> and non-obviousness and adequate disclosure and claiming of the invention. So those are um, all of the kinds of things that go on after we've decided that the invention is uh, eligible. And what we talk about in those situations, those collectively, we're talking about something called patentability. And um, random thought number one, as I was doing such, I'd have these random thoughts. I'd well, that's interesting. I'll write them down. Maybe they'll be interested in the random thought. The random <laughs> thought is um, the failure to distinguish between eligibility of subject matter and the patentability of that subject matter can lead to less than helpful uh, legal opinions. And by George, is this one of them? This is the poster child for confusing eligibility and patentability. But that, what does that mean? It means just because an invention relates to eligible subject matter, that gets you into the door of the PTO. But no patent may be obtained if that invention lacked utility, lacked novelty, lacked, uh, or was obvious. But the, uh, the opposite is also true. No matter how useful, no matter how novel, no matter how not obvious the invention is, you still don't get a patent if it's definitionally not subject matter. It's been ruled off the list. So, um, there are exceptions that have been created in the United States by judicial uh, uh, decisions. And what it says is um, these are the kinds of things that have held, been held to be definitionally uh, Uneligible. You don't even get into the patent. You don't get to examine anything uh, relative to novelty or obvious or anything. And there are laws of nature, natural phenomenon, and abstract ideas. That's those are the those are the three. Now, as courts 
deal with that, they start making up new words. And so uh, what we have listed below are some of what the court also uh, considers to be um, uh, ineligible subject matter. Uh, natural phenomena, products of nature, natural products, naturally occurring things, scientific principles, systems depending on human intelligence alone, disembodied concepts, mental processes, disembodied mathematical algorithms or formulas. Courts have used all this language. Collectively, what they're trying to say are this type of stuff, laws of nature, natural phenomena, abstract ideas, aren't eligible subject matter to begin with. These are all developed. Not, you don't find these in our patent law, not written down anywhere, all judicial decisions, judge-made law, if you will. Let's look at Europe for a second. Europe takes a different tact. What they say is, uh, rather than to define these classes like machines, compositions of matter, um, what they do is they define what's patentable in general and then make a list of specific exceptions. So what the patent, European patent law says is patents shall be granted for any invention, any invention, which are susceptible to uh, industrial application, we would call that utility, which are new, that's our novelty standard, and which uh, involve what they call an inventive step. That's our, uh, our non-obviousness standard. What is that quantum of, of uh, intellect that's needed to get above uh, just being simply novel and, and useful. And that's what we learned about in the, in the previous lecture. Notice there's no statutory classes in, in, in the European law. <clears throat> so then what do they do? They say, we'll make a list. In our law, we'll make the list. And the list says the following in particular shall not be regarded as inventions within the meaning of paragraph one. And they, here it sounds starting to sound familiar. Discoveries, scientific theories, mathematical methods, aesthetic creation, schemes, rules, methods of performing mental acts, playing games, doing business, programs for computers, and presentations. That, so they made a list of, of what that information is that's going to be ineligible. Right? And, but who made the list? Well, the legislature made the list. The equivalent of our Congress in Europe, the European Union, made the list. Judges didn't make Right? And um, now, to be fair, some of the list came from judicial decisions and they decided to codify it, but um, it's not judge-made law. It's, it's made by the legislature um, in, in Europe. There's all kinds of other things. Methods of treating human and animal body by surgery or therapy or diagnostic methods shall not be regarded. Um, it does. Although methods for treatment aren't patentable in Europe, the drugs are. See, it says the provisional synodicide of products. So thank goodness we still have pharmaceutical industry uh, in Europe. Um, uh, here's a good. Here's a great one. You know, this this would have this this would have gone crazy in the United States. But it says uh, inventions uh, the public exploitation of which would be contrary to the word of public or morality uh, are are not. Patentable, and that this issue has actually come up in Europe on, on several occasions. M more recently, um, the Green Party ruled or uh, argued the, at, at the European uh, Patent Office and in uh, on appeal that genetically engineered plants were were uh, immoral and uh, uh, against public order. That, that argument failed, by the way, but um, it's still it's on the books in. In, in Europe. Also, plant and animal varieties or essentially biological processes for producing plants and animals uh, uh, are not patentable in Europe, but um, microbes are. They decide to split the baby. Um, so the take home message comparing Europe and the United States is uh, if it's not on the list of, if it's not on the list of exceptions, the only way that patents get rejected in Europe is if they fail on the patentability side of, of they made the eligibility list, so now all they have to do is, is uh, the only inquiry has to do with, uh, has to do with patentability. Okay, what was the issue? Uh, we're talking about the Myriad um, case, uh, and um, 
The issue before the Supreme Court was whether a naturally occurring segment of deoxyribonucleic acid, DNA, uh, is patent eligible, patent eligible uh, under 101 by virtue of its isolation from the human genome. Um, because DNA is a polymer, it's a chemical polymer, it's definitionally a composition of matter. No, no question that it's a composition of matter, right? The, the, therefore, uh, the only issue in this case should have been, does it fit one of the exceptions that the judges uh, had made? Um, what they said was, uh, we hold that naturally occurring DNA segment uh, is a product of nature, it's not patent eligible merely because it's been isolated. That cDNA is patent eligible because it's non naturally occurring. And I'll tell you what cDNA is uh, in, in a minute. So that was their, that was their holding. Okay, um, here's a little science. Don't panic. <laughs> How many, would, how many of you would say that you have a, a level of bio, knowledge of biology at the college freshman level? That's good. How many not? Be proud. How many not? <laughs> you all could be on the Supreme Court. <laughs> you other people, not a chance. <laughs> right? Okay, here's some, here's some science. The average woman has a 12 to 13 percent chance of developing breast cancer by the age of 95. About 5 percent of breast cancers have been shown to have some sort of genetic basis as opposed to environmental uh, uh, basis. Um, that number, with respect to genetic, rises to 25 percent when we talk about early onset breast cancers, which are before the age of 40. These genes, and this wasn't uh, developed in the case at all. Um, the protein that these genes encode um, work to suppress tumors. They are, they are proteins that repair damage to DNA. And that's, that's good because uh, there's a theory about cancer that it, it's based on the accumulation of mutations. So these, these, these proteins help you fight cancer by, by removing by repairing damage to DNA. The problem becomes, if you have a mutation in that gene, then it doesn't do a very good job of removing the mutations and the cancers develop. So it's an important, um, uh, important uh, 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 issue. And it, it's reflected in the fact that women carrying the BRCA1 uh, mutated gene have a, ri a risk of, of 50 to 80% of developing breast cancer and 20 to 50 percent developing cervical cancer. Also, they found out that certain cancer treatments work better against these kinds of cancers than, than other cancers. So it's important to know what kind, if you have a BRCA1 lesion or, or not. Um, more, more science, sorry. Um, human somatic cells, uh, such as breast cells, have 22 pairs of chromosomes. They're called autosomes and one pair of sex chromosomes, XX for women, XY for male. That in the 23 pairs of chromosomes, about 6 billion, with B, 6 billion base pairs of DNA. Chromosomes are made up of chromatin, which is 65% protein, 35% DNA, 5% RNA. This is what genes are in nature. They're located on chromosomes, they're associated with protein, there's a whole bunch of them that are in strings. Um, the BRCA1 gene, they, the inventors discovered this, uh, is located on one particular chromosome, chromosome 17. BRCA2 gene was on chromosome 13. Chromosome 17 is comprised of one single strand of DNA, the whole chromosome, one strand. Every chromosome is like that, no big deal. Um, uh, the DNA is about 80 million. Uh, so from the, we've gone down from billion, uh, this one chromosome has 80 million nucleotide base pairs. Chromosome 13 has 114 million. All right. Talk about finding a needle in a haystack. All right. Moving on. Um, the native BRCA1 gene with its introns, and I'll explain that in a second, uh, um, 
has, a, uh, is, has about 80,000 nucleotides in it. Minus the introns, uh, we, we call exons, um, it's about 55,000 nucleotides. That uh, uh, exon-only DNA never occurs in nature, ever. Here's what happens. Where's anybody? Oh, here you go. A gene has um, an intron, an exon, an intron, an exon, intron, exon. They're interspersed in, in, in DNA. Uh, in the case of um, uh, in the case of um, BRCA1, there are 24 of these exons. Right? In BRCA2, there's 27. So the problem is the exons are the only ones that code for the protein. So somehow you've got to get all the exons together at some stage. And what that stage is, it is when, the, when genetic information leaves DNA, it goes into a molecule called RNA. And then the RNA goes to the cytoplasm and makes, goes to the ribosome and you, and you make proteins, right? DNA to RNA to protein. Uh, the, um, so what happens is the RNA has all the introns, exons in it, and then it gets spliced. The introns move out, out, the introns move out of the way, they get clipped, and it's a very precise, the exons get associated with one another. It's very precise because um, the message in the, in the DNA or in the RNA is read in groups of three nucleotides. And sometimes one of the nucleotides is on one exon and the other two are on the other exon. So when they come together, it has to be absolutely perfect whether you have to make garbage information. So, but never, ever, ever do the exons and introns leave the DNA. It's always done at the level of RNA. Well, why is that? Well, the DNA has to, has to divide sometime to make a new cell, and you don't want to go running around saying, where the hell are my introns? I've got to put them back in, right? So they leave, you know, the, the introns and exons stay, stay together in the DNA, in nature, right? Okay, that's one of the reasons why the, we'll find out that the cDNA turns out to be patentable. Because what these uh, <coughs> scientists did fairly cleverly was take the mRNA that was only exons, and they used an enzyme and made DNA from the RNA. So now they have a piece of DNA that's only exon DNA. And they call that complementary DNA, cDNA, because it's a complement of the, <coughs> of the RNA. And the court said that's patentable, that's in invention. Of, of man. So what's what what's the issue? Um, <clears throat> it's clear from reading the cases at, at, at the district court and the the um, um, <clears throat> a federal circuit and at the Supreme Court itself that the, the justices did not understand the science. And the way you know that that's true is that the parties had to rely on five, five analogies and one deuces ex maxima in order to explain to the court what the hell's going on. And um, so anytime you see, um, you see that situation, you know you're going to be in trouble. Because anytime you try to use an analogy, you're going to lose it. There's no such thing as a perfect analogy, so something's going to get lost in the analogy. So the analogies were uh, the DNA. DNA is like a tree uh, in a forest, and the leaves, which the idea is it's a piece of DNA patentable over the leaf, as, as opposed to, well, the leaves aren't, patent, aren't patentable, but the sap might be if it's concentrated. Okay. <laughs> um, a baseball bat carved out of a tree would be patentable. Um, a statue carved out of marble might be patentable. Well, no, not really. It might be a subject of a copyright, but not going to be if it's a work of art for Christ's sakes. <laughs> um, a cookie recipe uh, might be patentable as a method, but flour, eggs, and salt. 
not so much. Um, a kidney isolated um, from uh, the body uh, is it might not be painful. <coughs> and then comes and then comes the deus sex ma you know what deus sex maxima is? Oh, you don't know that. Uh, it's a literary English majors. It's a literary device, right? Yeah. What, what does it do? The God comes in and saves everything at the end. Yeah, you, you, uh, an <coughs> author writes himself into a corner and something, and oh, it's always a dream. <laughs> or you know, the gods, the gods, the, the gods come in and save save the day. Literally, that's where the phrase comes from. It gets gets the hero out of trouble. Well, the Solicitor General of the United States invented. Uh, the, the, the problem was, here I have, a, I have an isolated piece of DNA and that I'm trying to claim as a composition of matter, right? Isolated from all this other stuff that occurs in nature. And the a Solicitor General says, aha, but that DNA has a sequence. And I have a, ready, magic microscope. And the magic microscope allows me to go back to the original DNA and I can find that sequence in my magic microscope. But for some reason I can't find the magic, I can't find the sequence in the, in the cDNA. My magic microscope doesn't do that. This is a Solicitor General of the United States. <laughs> uh, I have something else to say about that. <laughs> really? This is here. Not that I'm going to exercise. I know why. Nita told me to do this because she likes to see me get rid of the face while I talk about this case in patent class. Um, the U.S., uh, the patent office was a defendant at the district court level. The plaintiffs sued not only Myriad and the University of Utah, but they, they sued the patent office uh, on the grounds that they were unconstitutionally allowing these kinds of cases having to do with isolated DNA, which they had been doing for about 20 or 30 years, right? And, um, but because the district court uh, decided the case purely on patent grounds, not on constitutional grounds, they didn't have to reach the constitutional issue. Therefore, the, the U.S. Patent Office got off the hook. Who represents the U.S. Patent Office in cases? The Solicitor General, right? So they're out of the game. So what does the Solicitor General do? They petition the court, can we come in as an amicus, allegedly to being neutral, but not really. Uh, they join the other side against the patent. And they invent things like the uh, magic microscope, which actually came up at one point. Is that an invention? So, but, uh, so um, they, they've actually joined, joined the other side. Not, not helpfully, because the Supreme Court listens to the Solicitor General. They often ask the Solicitor General to uh, give the view of the government. And the Patent Office was chided, because what in the world is a Patent Office has no right to be setting <coughs> patent law. You know, it's an administrative agency, it doesn't make law, doesn't, shouldn't make it. Well, who gave the right to the Solicitor General to make patent law, right? Um, so we'll, we'll say a little bit more about that. Um, uh, the, uh, another indication that the court didn't quite grasp is if you read Section 1, our, uh, Part A of the opinion, which the court decides to tell you about genetics. <laughs> not, not good. <laughs> um, would have probably gotten a C minus in my genetics class. More, the most egregious statement was each codon either tells the ribosome which of the 20 amino acids to synthesize and provides a stop signal that ends amino acid synthesis. Doesn't have anything to do with amino acids in synthesis. Amino acids are synthesized in the cytoplasm by a bunch of metabolic pathways. What's being synthesized here is a protein. It's made up of amino acids. <laughs> um, and instead of calling it complementary DNA, it, what, did it, what does the Supreme Court call it? An inverse image. Well, it's not an inverse image. Inverse image would be if you turn the DNA away, go that way, right? It's not a complement. 
Um, and it blessed with their hearts, even the author of the synopsis. Yeah, I know the synopsis is not a case. But the writer of the synopsis <laughs> calls CNDA co composite DNA for Christ. So, you know, they don't, you know, don't understand, don't understand the science. Um, what were the claims? The claims um, had to do with compositions of matter, that is the isolated DNAs, um, and the gene products, the sequences um, were um, some cDNAs, some exons, there were mutations, and there were fragments. And that was important because the fragments are what were used in the diagnostic test. You don't want to try to do a diagnostic test with something 15 on, uh, 5,000 nucleotides on. You have a little piece of it that you use for your diagnostic test. Um, and there were some methods for doing anti-cancer anti uh, drug screening. Well, the, the claims before the Supreme Court, and that's the one we're only going to talk about today, are the composition of matter claims. The method claims uh, weren't before the Supreme Court. So, here's, um, there were a number of patents, a number of claims at issue. Here's uh, one of the patents. What they said, the claim was an isolated DNA coding for the BRCA1 polypeptide. That's the, 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 uh, the DNA repair enzyme. Said polypeptide having uh, amino acid sequence set forth, and they gave the sequence of the amino acid uh, in the patent specification. Um, uh, just, for, just for review, for claim, claiming, uh, we talk about claims having a preamble, a transition, and a body. And the preamble may or may not be limiting, it depends on what the preamble says. Uh, the transition will tell you whether the claim is considered to be open or closed. Uh, open claim admits to new uh, additional materials other than the claim. Um, in, in other words, if, I, if my claim is claiming A, B, and C, uh, and somebody comes along and adds D, if I have an open claim, my claim will cover the composition of A, B, C, and D because it has A, B, and C in it. That's what my claim is, right? So that's an open claim. A closed claim only um, contains, or is, is interpreted to um, mean A, B, and C, nothing else. And um, so uh, we have magic language in patent law uh, developed from the case law that tells us that if I use the word comprising, it's considered to be open. And if I use the word consisting, it becomes closed. Mystical, magical language. So, and all patent attorneys know, know, the, know the rules. Those are conical uh, rules. So what do these guys do? They use the word having. <laughs> They'll see, you know. So what's having? Is it open or is it closed? Well, the courts have looked at that before. People have used it. Wasn't, these weren't, they, didn't, they didn't invent, these guys didn't invent having. Um, the, their cases, and cases say, well, generally, uh, having is open, but it depends on what the specification tells you how open it is. It's not quite as open as, as comprising, but it's not quite as closed as consisting of, so you have to look at the specification. What the um, drafters did, and the inventors did, they used having, they used isolated as limitations of the claim and throughout the specification they actually define the word isolated in the specification here are a list of definitions so the court is supposed to say aha that's what the inventors mean by uh, isolated in the in the case now a, 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 you can, as an attorney you can be they say you can be your own lexographer you can make up your your language, and th and that's true to a point. You can't you can't say for the purpose of this invention, black is white and white is black. You can't you know pervert the ordinary meaning. But if you have a special meaning for a word isolated, um, maybe it's good to put it in the specification. This is what I mean by the word isolated. And they did. And if you read it, it turns out that it co it covers just about everything except the DNA as it exists in the chromosome. That's what they were, they were worried about the product of nature argument. So they ruled it out of the claim. You know, um, 
So, but apparently that that uh, that didn't that didn't sway um, the analysis. Um, oh, this is the seventh claim um, that I want to just point out to you. Um, this turns out to be the most important part of the invention because <clears throat> although the normal call it normal gene, uh, which was the subject of of the first claim. Um, those are, that was the genetic sequence that was associated with non-symptomatic individuals, okay? It, it, the, the court goes off track a little bit. They start talking about things called wild types. And, um, I don't know, well, it's worth five, yeah, it's worth five minutes. Um, <laughs> in, um, <clears throat> In genetic studies, where you work with um, organisms in the laboratory, as, as uh, you know, like lab rats and and um, Neurospora and fruit flies or whatever, the scientists get together and they decide what the standard is, and everything's measured. That's a true breeding organism; they highly inbred it, and. If it's a wild type, it's, it's, it, it came from nature at some point, but it's been inbred. And if it's Drosophila, it has orange eyes. It has wings of a certain length. It has a body with a certain color. It has a certain number of bands around the body. That's the wild type. And um, uh, all the mutations that ever developed with, are always with reference back to what the wild type was. Well, when we talk about human genetics, <laughs> Um, our, our, our claim to fame is we are wonderfully diverse. Look around the room. There are no wild types, right? There are no inbred standards. Everybody's different. So how do you go about doing um, and referring in terms of uh, doing uh, human genetics? Well, what you, what you do is look at it on a gene-by-gene -gene basis. And you look at it sometimes in families or collections of families um, that are related, right? And that's that's why this case was sort of interesting. It came out of the University of Utah with a high Mormon population, and they keep terrific records that go back generations. And I wouldn't you can't say they're inbred, certainly not, but they're you know they're, they're the limitations. They are not a they would rather marry Mormons and stay in Utah. And um, <laughs> so, um, the, uh, except for two years when they go out and then they go back and play for BYU because you're two years older. Um, other than that, um, uh, the important part here, however, is by using these uh, uh, familial uh, associations, we're able to, to find a gene that wasn't associated very much with breast cancer, but they found these mutations that were. So what was really critical was the finding the mute, not, not finding the normal gene as much as was finding the mutations that were associated. So here are they're claiming specific changes in the standard well, um, reference, we'll call it, our uh, DNA that um, was uh, what was important for their for their uh, tests. Now um, if you go back, can I go back? Let's see. Um, what, what this first claims is, um, I'm claiming a DNA, right? Claiming a DNA um, that codes for the protein. Well, the genetic code is redundant. That means there are different code words for the same amino acid. Okay? And so let me go forward. If I took the first 10 amino acids of that BRCA, one protein, and I put underneath them the number of codons that are associated with each of those amino acids, this one, two, six, 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 six. Um, the product rule for probability will tell you that there are 165,888 different DNA sequences that would code for that, those 10 amino acids if they are all independently, if you can change them independently. Codes for exactly the same amino acid. If you um, took the next 10 amino acids, um, uh, it goes uh, over a million, a billion real quick. That's the first 20 amino acids of that protein. 
There are 1,836 amino acids in that protein. So it becomes astronomical the number of sequences that would theoretically be possible to encode that protein. So one of the objections of that claim is, my God, it's too broad. Which it may, in fact, be a legitimate uh, problem. And the problem, though, is that's a patentability issue. It's not an eligibility issue. So I don't care if it's obscenely broad if I'm trying to answer the question of whether it's patent eligible or not. Um, <clears throat> random thought uh, number three. Um, sequences are not patentable. Chemical formula is not patentable. What's patentable is a compound a composition of matter which can be characterized by a sequence or a chemical formula. It can be characterized by its molecular weight. It can be characterized by its composition, its melting point, lots of things. But this and a sequence is one of them. So I've written the formula for water. It's a graphic representation of the molecule. It is, whatever the composition is, is whatever the composition of this pen is in combination with whatever the composition of this blackboard is. I, oh, it's not wet. It's a formula, for God's sake. It's the same thing with a sequence. Not patentable. Not patentable. Sequences aren't patentable. I can put sequence information into databases. Lots of, lots of sequence information. Am I putting DNA in the database? No, I'm putting sequence information in the database. I can manipulate the sequences. I can just find new sequences. I can uh, go to the board and make a bunch of new sequences. Am I infringing the DNA patent? No, I'm not making and using DNA. I'm using my pencil. Sequences aren't patentable. So why is it that if I go find a sequence somewhere, all of a sudden something is an eligible patent? That's the, that's the fatal flaw in, in some of this. DNA is a chemical polymer. It's conventional of workers of ordinary skill in the art. We talked about that. That's the person that this patent is directed to. It's not, unfortunately, directed to the Supreme Court. It's not directed to me because I'm extraordinarily skilled in the art. <laughs> That's the other, uh, Jeff was talking about practice tips when you, when you talk about obviousness. The same guy, the ordinary skilled artisan, is the one that will make the determination about whether it's obvious or not. That's the trick you can use with the patent office, because the first obvious rejection you get is from the patent examiner. And you say, well, of course it's obvious to you. You're extraordinarily skilled in the art. It's, you know, that doesn't count. That works about once for every patent examiner. <laughs> so, if I, the skilled artisan would recognize and understand that the symbols TGCA represent this, this chemical formula. That's T, that's G, that's C, that's A. That's what the biologists understand the, that, that, those four letters to mean. Apparently, um, the, it makes statements from the court like Marianne's claims were not expressed in terms of chemical composition. The hell they weren't. <laughs> I mean, it was right there. That the 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 uh, patent. Um, I got a piece of it here. It's 104 pages long, and that's because they could use ATCs. Can you imagine how long the patent would be? How many pages it would be if you had to write out all those symbols? All, I mean, the uh, Structure and what what extra information do you get um, by doing that? It's just bizarre. Random thought number five. I'm gonna do it all the time. Um, um, what are we to make of statements like we must determine whether Myriad's patent claims any new and useful composition of matter? Holy mackerel! Um, separating a gene from its surrounding genetic material. You ready? Jeff, don't say it. Don't say it. 
not an act of invention. Oh my God, here we go again. I mean, it's, it's just scary. Um, are we heading back, like Jeff suggested, uh, to the 30s uh, through 50s? Um, is the, the phrase that was used in a lot of those cases was something called the want of invention. And um, is now, we are, are we rearing our ugly head uh, about, uh, about want of invention? Um, the, um, let me, I'll, I'll just read you a couple of uh, uh, other cases. Uh, the, um, when we, when, when courts, as Jeff was saying, talked about obviousness, um, they're trying to figure out what that extra little piece of inventive uh, effort needs to be. And uh, what Kuno said was, the invention must reveal the flash of creative genius, uh, not merely the skill in the art. So this, this was during a particularly uh, anti-patent period for the court. Um, Judge Leonard Hand said, the standard is as fugitive, impalpable, wayward, and vague a phantom as exists in the whole paraphernalia of legal concepts. <laughs> That's what he's talking about, of, 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 of this want of invention. This is 1950. This is before uh, Judge Rich, uh, bless his heart, um, uh, helped us with, with uh, non-obviousness. Um, Justice Jackson of the Supreme Court said, the court has developed such a strong passion for striking down patents under its increasingly strict invention um, standard that the only patent that's valid is the one the court has yet to get its hands on. Oh my God. This is not a, not a happy day. Not a happy day in the, in the, in the uh, 40s and, and 50s. So what does the Supreme Court do in Myriad to shore up their conclusion that this is not a patentable invention, uh, isolating DNA from its natural environment and so on. They go back to a 1948 case called Funk Brothers. And I'll just take a few minutes and I'll read uh, what I wrote about that case. This is my new uh, a treatise on patent uh, it's a plug. Uh, I would be going to donate this to your library uh, after uh, after the after the lecture. Let me let me tell you what I um, I said uh, towards the end of a particularly anti-patent period. The Supreme Court again addressed the product of nature issue. This time in connection with the inoculants of soil bacteria involved in the process of nitrogen fixation. The court began its discourse on the patented technology by stating. This is a quote. Through some mysterious process, leguminous plants are able to take nitrogen from the air and fix it in the plant for conversion to organic nitrogen compounds. Well, it turns out the plant, they know about much biology as they don't know then, as they know about genetics now. Um, uh, the plant isn't involved at all. It's a bunch of bacteria. But what the plant does is produce roots. And on the roots are a bunch of bacteria that fix the nitrogen. And that's how the plant gets, the, gets its nitrogen. The plant doesn't do anything. The subject of the invention related to the first step of nitrogen fixation, namely the conversion of nitrogen gas to ammonia by the action of a bacteria called rhizobium. It was pointed out by the court at the time the invention was made, it was appreciated that at least six different species of rhizobium existed. And there was a plant-host um, relationship with the bacterial species, that is, uh, one species of rhizobium didn't infect or did with all kinds of plants. So uh, one species lived with alfalfa, one species lived with garden peas, one uh, species lived with um, uh, uh, soybeans or so on. Um, it was appreciated that the various strains existed within each species and the strains could be distinguished on their relative efficiency of fixing nitrogens. Stronger nitrogen fixing strains could be separately cultured from nature, formulated into inoculants, powders, and sprays used on leguminous plants, and um, 
Finally, it was also known if you tried to mix two rhizobium species uh, and use that formulation, each bacterial species inhibited the other from colonization of the respective plants. So it was assumed that all members of the rhizobium species were mutually inhibitory. As a result, the commercial inoculants were formulated separately. So if a farmer wanted to grow soybeans, alfalfa, and clover, he had to buy six, uh, three different products. Well, what the inventor discovered was the existence of strains of rhizobium that while retaining the ability to re colonize the respective host, were not inhibitory to the other species. Further, it was discovered that these strains could be isolated, cultured, and prepared and mixed in, in as inoculants. So claim four says inoculant of a leguminous plant comprising a plurality of selected mutually non-inhibitory strains and the strains being unaffected um, um, by each other with respect to their ability to find a, a fixed nitrogen in the plants for which they are specific. So there was a lawsuit. And the Supreme Court uh, found the um, claims to be invalid. And what they said was the inventor did not create the property of it inhibition or not inhibition. And those were uh, the work of nature. And um, so therefore you can't have a patent under the, under the uh, principle of nature exception to, to 101. And they said um, the product claims were invalid for, sorry, want of invention. No! And um, this, uh, that was the district court. The uh, Seventh Circuit reversed said that this is a patentable uh, invention, um, and the Supreme Court reversed and upheld the, the district court. Um, in, the, in the course of their um, discourse, they cite as a, pre a guiding principle, Cuno engineering, which means flash of genius. Um, and then, in a classic example of what we uh, uh, call hindsight engineering, the court actually placed the inventor's own discovery of non-inhibition uh, into the prior art and used it to denigrate the invention. The court said, once the secret of nature was discovered, the state of the art made it a simple step. But yeah, I mean, all inventions are obvious after you read about it, you know. That's why you know, some people have slanted, you know, slanted shoulders and sloping foreheads, because you ask them a question, they go like that, and you get the answer, oh, like that. And so, uh, you know, of course it's obvious when you read the specification, that's what the invention's about. Um, so this hindsight engineering is, that was what some of the uh, uh, Federal Circuit was trying to get away from by using this suggestion motivation. Sure, you have, here's, here are the elements, Here's, here's a reference here, and here's, how did you find it? Well, I read the specification, right? And I found a reference that matched this part of the specification. But I'm teaching you, that's not part of the prior art. Right? The, the, com the combination's in the specification. It's not in these two pieces of art, right? So, um, the, um, the uh, what happened was, um, in the concurring opinion, Justice Frankfurter uh, attempted to down um, uh, grade um, um, uh, what the court was saying, and in fact, the, the majority also said that as well. They were the whole sudden they were realizing that their natural phenomenon, product of nature rationale, wasn't working so well. What they said was that um, the aggregation of strains were a mere advancement in the packing arts. <laughs> so it was an obvious, you know. So somehow we went from a product of nature argument that fails uh, to an obviousness. Problem was easy to do once you knew what the secret was. So it turns out this is an obvious this case that the Supreme Court now uses to resurrect for want of invention. And it's, um, and, you know, in their defense, and I, I want to be fair, um, well, here's 101 again. What it says is uh, anybody who discovers a new and useful uh, process. This uh, and see new and useful are what patentability standards and eligibility standards, right? This part of the statute is ancient. It goes back to our 1790 and 1793 acts. If our founding fathers read 101 today, they would immediately recognize what they wrote. It's old. 
Because in the early, uh, the, old, the early patent act was three pages long. So they put everything in, in a couple of paragraphs. So they have patentability and, and eligibility all rolled into one paragraph. Uh, you see no use, you don't see obvious in that, in that list, right? Well, it wasn't there in 1790. It wasn't there until 1952, right? So the court focuses on these kinds of things and you know, starts integrating patentability considerations with, um, with uh, um, eligibility considerations. Judge Rich, um, that, that, that Jeff talked about, um, <clears throat> I'll get you the site here. I have it here somewhere. Um, um, where it's really concerned that the courts were confusing this issue, and he wrote a wonderful article in the um, in the journal of the uh, American Patent Law Association Quarterly Journal, and it's been recently reprinted because of the 40th anniversary. It's uh, APLA Journal 411, uh, page 1, 2013. Um, and it has a foreword by George, uh, Judge Michelle. And it should be absolute required reading for any judge that's trying to do a 101 case. It's, 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 it's just absolutely wonderful. Um, here's here's some, some, I'm just, uh, how am I doing? What do I have? A couple of minutes. Couple of minutes. Um, let me just quickly say, um, Here's a problem. Uh, using 101 as a remedy uh, in courts, uh, you may be successful in knocking the patent down, as, as, as the case was uh, here, except for the cDNA. Um, but the problem is, because it's a 101 issue, it, it puts all the other patents in, in existence that happen to have isolated DNA in their claim suspect. And, um, that's why the, the, uh, the uh, uh, Myriad and, and, his, and his colleagues um, uh, relied so heavily on a, a doctrine we call settled expectations. Turns out there were over 3,000 patents that were of that form already issued by the, by the patent office. And the patent office explained why you should use the word isolated. Uh, to get away from a product of nature rejection and so on. Um, and uh, that argument failed at the Supreme Court. It failed for two reasons. One is they, the court says we can't find any, any evidence that Congress approves of your, of your um, act activities. And the second thing was the treasonous and ultra-viral remarks of the Solicitor General. Because what they said is, uh, the, the court says, look, the government's telling you that this is what the law should be. So the patent office, what, what basis do you have for making isolated a, a key term to, to, to make something patentable? Well, like I said, who, who, left, who died and left the Solicitor General in charge of our patent law? Uh, it's got to be Congress that's going to decide what the law is. Um, <clears throat> If you think, and uh, they, uh, the court says, well, we didn't talk about this, we didn't talk about this, the, the implication is it's a fairly narrow position. Well, I'll tell you. Uh, Wednesday, Wednesday, the US Patent Office comes out with new rules. And guess what? It's not just limited to DNA. It's any kind of product in nature that's been isolated is all, all of a sudden not patentable. If, if the only thing you did was isolate it. Serious, serious problem for lots and lots of companies. Um, um, here's, a, here's an interesting thing. Um, the the, the uh, Supreme Court said, oh yeah, that one piece of DNA with all the exons in it, that's patentable because that's a hand of man. But the, uh, like I said, that's about 5,000 nucleotides long. The inventors tried to claim a piece, a little bit, to, a little bit of the, especially around the places where the mutations were to use for their tests. No, not patentable. So I've got patentable subject matter, but all of a sudden a fragment of it isn't patentable subject matter. Why? Because I can find the sequence in some other place in the genome. The sequence, not the molecule that I'm trying to claim, the sequence of the molecule. You know? um, here we go again. 
Um, this notion of, of Congress not, you know, not, not finding any act, act, um, evidence of congressional action, it's, it's a tough one. It's a tough one because if Congress is happy with what you're going, doing, they're not going to act. Right? It's only when they're unhappy with something you do that you find that they do something, right? And so I started in my mind, uh, one of the cases that was mentioned in this case was the JEM Act Supply case, Pioneer versus JEM. And that's, we, we, and I say that literally, uh, because I was the chief counsel of Pioneer Hybrid at the time, and at the court were making these arguments, and we said, listen, there's been 2,000 patents on plants issued. If you upset this, uh, all, we have these settled expectations, the industry's gonna collapse, right? Luckily, was able, I was able to find uh, a, a one part of the patent law that Congress passed during this whole uh, foray that, in fact, um, supported the fact that, that Congress was in favor of patents, utility patents on plants. But it was a tough sell. So I started thinking to myself, what, here's something that wasn't mentioned in the case at all. Maybe this would have been a hook um, for uh, Myriad. And it said, um, it has to do with GATT trips. GATT is the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trades. And it talks about, this was an uh, effort by the government, the United States government, to get everybody's, everybody else in the world's patent up to snuff, right? And, we, and, they, and they said, if you're going to be a trading partner with us, you've got to upgrade your patent law, right? And it says, here's what it says. It says, um, you should have patents available in all fields of technology, and you shouldn't discriminate between place of invention and field of technology. And um, I'll, I'll skip one quickly. Europe had some problems because they weren't allowing DNA patents. And so what Europe did is the European legislature changed the European. Uh, um, uh, they, they did what's called the Directive for the Protection, and they said, um, inventions which meet the usual threats holes, that is novelty, industrial act, you know, the patentability says, shall be patented even if they concern a biological material. And they define biological materials DNA, and they further said that when the biological material is isolated from its natural environment, produced by means of a technical process, this may be the subject even if it previously occurred in nature. So they changed their whole law to comply with TRIPS, right? Um, and um, the uh, European Patent Office followed along. This was the, from the European Union. They're not related, but the European Patent Office went along and said in their rules, biotechnology advantages are patentable if the material is isolated from its natural environment and produced by a technical or even though it previously occurred in nature. So that's the law in Europe now. You get the DNA patents. Why? Because we pushed them to do that. So what did the Congress do? Congress passed its own act it, it, to, to uphold the GATT TRIPS agreement. And one thing that they did was they got rid of Section 104. Why did they get, sec why did they get rid of Section 104? Because 104 discriminated among foreign inventors and U.S. inventors. So we don't have that anymore. So that's, that's what they're trying to do to come into, into, into compliance with TRIPS. Um, <clears throat> Um, and so, what did so the, what what did we what did we use to do with respect to DNA? We didn't do anything. Why? Because it was patentable under the under the rules of the U.S. Patent Office. So Congress didn't act. Didn't have to act. So it's not surprising that Congress was was silent. Here's one other thing. Um, look at the patent. This is the front page of the patent. Here are the assinees. What are assinees? Assinees are owners of the patent, right? Who are Myriad, you would expect. University of Utah um, Research Foundation, that was their owners, you expect. Who's the third owner of the patent? The United States of America. For God's sake, the Solicitor General is arguing against his own country. You know? I don't understand. What that means, what that means really, is that it probably has something to do with what we call the Buy Dole Act, which gives the government marching rights to this to these patents. Um, which means that if it wanted, 
presumably, they could practice the invention for any government purpose. The, any government worker, any, all the, the, the uh, uniform services and so on, they could take a chunk out of Myriad's market by doing the product themselves, if, in fact, it was a patentable invention. Unfortunately, not a patentable invention um, anymore, uh, thanks to the government. Well, um, let me, can I just say one more thing? Um, here's the 500-pound gorilla. You say, why, why, did it, why did the case come out this way? Uh, Judge Lori was really concerned about it. In his opinion, he said, this is what this case is not about. Because it's all over the briefs, it's all over the amicus briefs, it's everywhere. Um, whether individuals who have an increased risk of breast cancer are entitled to a second opinion. Whether the university and Myriad acted improperly in licensing and enforcing their patents. These were really expensive tests, $3,000 a pop. Okay? Um, um, uh, should patents be held that may save people's lives? Whether companies should be excluded from the market when their products are encompassed by the patent? Um, it's also not about whether the, patent, the claims are novel or non-obvious or too broad. It was about eligibility. All of these things, although the court didn't say it, um, was way on their minds. It's why the Solicitor General got it, because the Department of Justice decided we're not being fair to some women who are sick, we're going to fix these guys. Well, they fixed them, but they fixed about 20, about 2,000, 3,000 patents along with it. And it's really travesty. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't be surprised to see, maybe the government will have something to say about it in the, in the future in terms of uh, patentability. So um, that's my thoughts. <laughs>